Mr Owen Patterson. Thank you for calling me in this debate. This is a great day. This is a remarkable moment that we have a Conservative majority. Now I'm delighted to hear backed by the Labour opposition that is going to deliver a bill which will give the people of the UK a choice on who actually makes their laws and their regulations. And if I look at the mentors who encouraged me to come to this place over 20 years ago, sadly dead, my predecessor, uh, the late Lord Biffin of Tannat and the late Lord Ridley of Liddesdale, they would be delighted to see us have this opportunity to go back to the question, did this country vote to join our market in 1975, where, referring to the Shadow Foreign Secretary's late comment, recent comments, we can have the benefits of the market, we can embrace the world, we can get our full seat back on organisations like the World Trade Organisation. Yeah, yeah. We do not have to be told what to do by the political and judicial arrangements which we are currently under. Yeah. And we have a glorious moment in history because the Eurozone inevitably is going to have to move to become a coordinated country where significant money is shifted from the southern wealth creating areas of Germany and Holland to southern Europe. And we have a chance of a really radical change. And I'm delighted the Foreign Secretary has expanded this today. I'm delighted the Prime Minister has started. And we will have a real chance. But just very briefly, because I'm not just very briefly, I will just also recall other mentors who were in this House when I first came into this House. People like the late Lord Shaw of Stepney and indeed uh, the late Tony Benn. Mm-hmm. Endorsement of those key figures from the other side. Uh, I would just touch very briefly on two points. First of all, I, th- I think the timing, I would strongly advocate the Prime Minister, that's the maximum time for his negotiations. I would like to see the referendum held late 2017. And on the question, I personally would favour two positives, two positives rather than having a negative on one side. But the, the issue that really does concern me is this issue of the suspension of PERDA. And uh, I was dismayed to read, I'm afraid, the Foreign Secretary's comments on Conservative Home this morning. I'm afraid they are a nonsense. We have had the rules of PERDA developed steadily over 20 years. We just fought a general election, very satisfactorily, and the wheels of government continued to turn without attempts to use taxpayers' money to influence the way people voted. And I'd just briefly like to take the House through this long process. It goes right back to 1996, when the Nairn Report called on referendums, first of all, to be brought with an electoral law. We then saw the Welsh referendum when we on this side were in total disarray, and the result was extraordinarily narrow. 6,721 was the majority right across Wales. That was a 168 majority per seat. By any, any standards, a very marginal result. And there was very widespread satisfaction, particularly in North Wales, near where I come from, that the <coughs> result was affected by very significant intervention by the government. So we then pass on to Lord Neil of Bladen, whose committee in October 1998 came up with some absolutely key recommendations. First of all, I'd like to cite Professor Vernon Bogdanor of Oxford University, who taught the Prime Minister a thing or two about politics, philosophy and economics. And in a very telling contribution, he said, I hope also the committee will make some suggestions about referendums because one purpose of a referendum is to secure legitimacy for decisions where Parliament alone cannot secure that legitimacy. For that legitimacy to be secured, the losers have to feel that the fight was fairly conducted. And this is an absolutely fundamental issue. If the public have a sense, and the British public have a real sense of fairness, if they have a sense that this was rigged, the result will not be legitimate. So on the basis of that, the very distinguished figures on the Neil Committee proposed, and they said, our view is straightforward. We believe it is perfectly appropriate for the government of the day to state its views and for members of the government to campaign vigorously during referendum campaigns, just as they do during general election campaigns. But we also believe, just as in general election campaigns, neither taxpayers' money nor the permanent government machine, civil servants, official cars, the government information service and so forth should be used to promote the interests of the government side of the argument. In other words, referendum campaigns should be treated for these purposes in every way as though they were general election campaigns. And they went on, we believe it's extraordinarily difficult, if not impossible, for the government of the day to offer purely objective and factual information in the course of a referendum campaign 
especially when, as will usually be the case, it itself is a party to the campaign. We believe governments should not participate in referendum campaigns in this manner, just as it would be thought to be wholly inappropriate during a general election campaign for the government to print and distribute at the taxpayers' expense literature setting out government policy. And they actually made a recommendation, 89, the government of the day in future referendums should, as a government, remain neutral and should not distribute at public expense literature, even purportedly factual literature, setting out or otherwise promoting its case. Yeah, yeah. And then in an adjournment debate, and I would stress very senior respected figures on both sides <coughs> of the House participate in this long debate over 20 years. So here in this adjournment debate, 9th November 1998, on the Neil Report, you had significant contribution from the then Home Secretary Jack Straw, but Lords Fowler and McGregor of Pull and Market on our side called for full implementation of Neil. They were absolutely clear about that. And uh, Sir Norman Fowley's then was, said, however, we accept the findings in the report and believe that legislation based on it should be introduced with a proviso that it should implement all the major proposals. There should be no cherry picking of one proposal, leaving the others to one side. And we then move on, very interesting, Mr Speaker, to the second reading. The government produced a bill and the second reading was on the 10th of January 2000 when a significant intervention in column 36 by the member for Buckingham was made. And you said, Mr Speaker, <laughs> Mr. Speaker, you said, and only you could use a phrase such as this, I'm sure that the House has listened to the right honourable gentleman's historical exegesis with great interest. You went on to say very personally, and you were the first person to raise this issue of time, you went on to say, if he's against the purchase of votes, how does he justify promoting a bill that will allow the issue by ministers of official press releases in support, for example, of the abolition of our national currency, while regulating the activities of campaigning organisations in any such referendum for up to six months, thereby preventing the supporters of national self-government from effectively arguing their case. And that was a most pertinent intervention. Because the, issue, the, the, the issue on time then reappeared in the committee stage and sadly he's left to see my honourable learned friend from Beaconsfield, really argued hard in amendments, and you participated and I participated on the issue of SPADs and respected figures like the honourable member for South on the Deepings and the member for Stone and a number of us who've held this party together through the long winter of opposition, we all made the point that 28 days was not sufficient. We did not like Jack Straw's proposals on 28 days. And we were absolutely clear about that. And uh, the right honourable lady member said, we are worried that the 28-day period on its own will be insufficient. The particular mischief is that there will be a preliminary period in which the campaign that will be set up in opposition to the view that the government wants to put forward, but which they will subsume into their own campaign organisation. is not up and running because it's not received validation from the Commission. So, we had a further intervention from Lord Mackay Vard Brecknish, another very distinguished member of this side, who said, I believe that the PERDA should apply during the whole referendum period. I consider that to be fair and equitable. And so, as I draw my conclusion, it is absolutely clear, as we had an intervention yesterday, helpfully from the Electoral Commission, who said, we are therefore disappointed and concerned that the bill includes provision to remove the restrictions on the use of public funds by governments and others to promote an outcome right up until voters cast their vote. You no, have no, to no, ask. I just want to finish my comments now because I know others want to speak. You have to ask, Mr. Speaker, the question why. Why is this power, which has been debated by some very serious members of both sides of the House over a long period for 20 years, we've come up with what we on this side thought was a very unsatisfactory compromise of 28 days. Why is that being arbitrarily lifted? We fought a number of general election campaigns, cars continue to be made, cows continue to be milked, and the world did not stop. And it must be, it absolutely must be taken on board by the government that if the British people sense there's no fairness, that this is being rigged against them, that a deluge of local government, of national government, and above all European government money and propaganda can be dropped on them. And it won't just be election material, as the Foreign Secretary said. There will be reports, there will be briefs, there will be analyses of the terrifying consequences of, one of, the, of which way one of the votes might go. That will be unacceptable. That will go down extremely badly with the British people. And what really worries me, this extraordinary moment in our street, this incredibly important moment,
could be seen to be illegitimate. And whatever system of government for this country emerges after the referendum, it might not be seen to be valid. And I really would appeal to the Foreign Secretary to go back, talk to the Prime Minister, and remove this arbitrary dropping of a, a process of PERDA, which has been thrashed out over 20 years. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yeah.